Thanks for joining us for another Contagion Coronavirus Update. Today we're joined with Dr. Thomas Dilworth, who is a member of the Society of Infectious Diseases Pharmacists and recently gave a webinar on ARBs, ACIs, and NSAIDs. So he's gonna be reviewing his presentation. Thanks so much for joining us, Dr. Dilworth. We're excited to have you here with us today. All right, thanks for having me. Great, so why don't we just jump right in. Um, so, so far, what do we know about the SARS-CoV-2 virus and ACE2 receptors? Well, I think the, the important thing to get out right at right from the get-go here is we, we really don't know a lot about any of this stuff. I mean, this virus is only a few months old. We, there's a lot of unknowns, but we do know about SARS-CoV-2, which is the um, virus that causes COVID-19 infection, is that it likely uses the angiotensin converting enzyme 2 receptor, ACE2 receptor, to gain entry into the, into the human host. Um, this is based largely on data from a previous coronavirus, SARS-CoV-1, which used the ACE2 receptor. Um, there's been some in vitro cell line infection models looking at SARS-CoV-2 showing that ACE2, um, you know, is needed for um, the virus to gain cell entry, but there's really no appreciable proof in humans to definitively claim that SARS-CoV-2 uh, must use ACE2 to enter the human host. And there are definitely differences between SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2. The SARS-CoV-2 spike protein um, is a little bit different, and some have postulated that SARS-CoV-2 could potentially enter cells independent of ACE2. So I think the jury's out right now, um, but the working hypothesis is that SARS-CoV-2 does require, similar to SARS-CoV-1, uh, to utilize ACE2 for cell entry. And then, of course, this has led to this entire line of inquiry and ongoing debate about whether you should use an ACE or an ARB, whether you should stop it, whether it has therapeutic benefit, et cetera, uh, as it relates to COVID-19. So that kind of leads nicely into my next question, which is what do we know so far about the ACE and ARB use um, and the links to increased risk for SARS-CoV-2? Well, again, we, we, we don't know a lot. Uh, I think this is a very um, interesting area from a physiologic standpoint and a pharmacotherapeutic standpoint. I think we're gonna see a lot of literature and study come out in the next three to six months and even 12 months on this topic. Um, but the long story short here is we don't have any data to suggest ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers increase or decrease someone's risk of acquiring SARS-CoV-2, um, nor having a bad outcome or a better outcome uh, with the COVID-19 infection, which again is the infection caused by um, SARS-CoV-2. I think it's important to just review, um, you know, the renin angiotensin aldosterone system or RAS system as it as it exists in human beings. So there's a molecule called angiotensin that gets converted to angiotensin 1 and then angiotensin converting enzyme converts that into angiotensin 2. Now, angiotensin 2 um, can have deleterious effects in patients with diabetes and congestive heart failure and other cardiac uh, comorbidities. Specifically, it leads to sodium, it leads to an increase in aldosterone, sodium retention, water retention, and this can lead to obviously high blood pressure. ACE inhibitors and ARBs uh, provide a check on this system and allow these people to have better uh, long-term outcomes. But what's also interesting is if you, if you accept the premise that SARS-CoV-2 binds ACE2, um, there's data to suggest that that downregulates ACE2. And ACE2 actually provides a really important check on angiotensin II. It helps degrade that molecule into actually um, vasodilatory um, molecules, which um, reduce um, high blood pressure. Um, so ACEs and ARBs can actually upregulate um, ACE2, which is really important. When you look at some of the, the mirroring models that have um, investigated this a little bit, ACE2 can actually help um, mitigate some of the, the lung damage that happens with viral pneumonia. So there is a potential uh, to use these drugs therapeutically, but it hasn't really been bore out in humans as of yet. So what currently are the professional societies within the United States recommending in regard to the ACE inhibitors and the ARBs? That's a great question. And that's really where, where I think the, the most important consensus is on this issue. And that is 
the majority of the organizations that have weighed in on this in the United States have said continue taking ACEs and ARBs or patients should continue taking them. That's specifically the American Heart Association, the Heart Failure Society of America, the American College of Cardiology, the American College of Physicians, and even the American Society of Pediatric Nephrology, just to name a few. And there's a number of other organizations outside the U.S. that have reached similar conclusions. And I think the reason for this is uh, twofold. One, we don't have good data or any data really saying that there's detriment to using these. And we have really, really good data suggesting that somebody who has congestive heart failure or diabetes or other cardiac comorbidity, their long-term outcomes are vastly improved. Their mortality goes down when they take these agents. So when you, when you kind of put both of those pieces together, it's, it's almost a no-brainer to say, in somebody who meets guideline criteria for one of these agents, they should be taking them. And that includes patients who are new, newly diagnosed who may have had COVID-19 or, or have COVID-19, they if they're a candidate for one of these agents, they should be on it. So I know in your presentation, you also talked a little bit about NSAIDs. Um, so this is something that I've seen in the headlines a lot lately. What do we know about using this in individuals with COVID-19? Well, again, it's, it's, it's a similar story. Um, you know, we don't have much data. Um, to say one way or the other, um, but there's definitely no data suggesting you cannot use them. Um, I think people are scouring to find data to suggest you should or shouldn't use them. The only sort of modicum of data that I could find um, was, a, was again a murine model in which ibuprofen was given and shown to upregulate ACE2, which if you upregulate that ACE2 receptor, there's a potential to increase the likelihood that SARS-CoV-2 would bind. But there was also a number of positive effects um, in those um, in those mice. These were diabetic mice, and it actually um, yes, it upregulated ACE2, um, but it also provided a protective effect for the mice on their on on the heart and on the kidney. So. I think people made a bit of a leap with the ibuprofen thing. You know, somebody um, got on Twitter overseas and said, we shouldn't be using NSAIDs. And that really, like you said, there was a firestorm in the social media and the mainstream media, and it led to a lot of confusion. And, and thankfully for us, um, pharmacists and clinicians, the FDA, <clears throat> the World Health Organization, the European Medicines Agency, they all said, you can use ibuprofen. Um, there's also a number of leading US physicians um, IE physicians, Dave Aronoff, um, Anthony Fauci, who is advising um, President Trump over the course of this pandemic, and even Carlos Del Rio, um, all leading voices in the U.S. infectious disease com uh, community have said you can use ibuprofen and NSAIDs in patients with COVID-19. And I think another important point to make with, with NSAIDs is if, if you're looking for an agent to, an anti-inflammatory agent, be it an NSAID or Tylenol or acetaminophen, that decision should be made based on patient level factors, not whether or not the patient has COVID-19. So there are a number of patients for whom NSAIDs are not a good idea. Uh, for you know, patients with kidney disease and high blood pressure, patients who have had stomach ulcers in the past, um, asthmatics should not take aspirin. So th those are really the, the decisions that should be driving whether or not somebody gets an NSAID or, or something other than an NSAID like Tylenol um, if they have COVID-19. Are there any ongoing studies related to, you know, ACE inhibitors, ARBs, or NSAIDs that you're particularly excited about right now? Yeah, there are. So um, I queried clinicaltrials.gov this morning. There were uh, 12 studies that mentioned angiotensin and um, SARS-CoV-2. Probably the two that I'm most excited about um, were actually the two first entries in, in that list. Um, they're they have not started enrolling yet, but they're at the University of Minnesota, and they're looking at the potential therapeutic or the therapeutic potential of losartan, which is an ARB, for hospitalized and non-hospitalized patients with COVID-19 infection compared to standard of care. So I think doing that in sort of a randomized and a controlled fashion will really help shed some light as to whether or not giving these agents to somebody who otherwise doesn't need them. Um, would have a therapeutic advantage or not in patients with COVID-19. Um, I did also query um, looking for NSAIDs on clinicaltrials.gov this morning, and um, there's one study that's not enrolling yet, but it's going to be in France, and it's going to be in critically ill patients with COVID-19. 
and they're going to look at um, the proxen, which is an NSAID um, compared to standard of care, or the proxen with standard of care compared to the standard of care, and to see whether or not that has any impact on outcomes in critically ill patients with COVID-19. And it should be mentioned that naproxen is a, is a unique molecule and it does have some antiviral activity. It's been shown to have some activity against influenza. Um, so it's, they're, they're postulating the investigators that if it has some antiviral activity combined with its anti-inflammatory activity that there may be a potential therapeutic niche uh, for that drug in critically ill patients with COVID-19. So that's, that's, an, that's an exciting study to me. Great, thank you so much for that. So my next question is actually um, one that we, re we received from a member of our um, web webinar audience from last week. So this person asks, ACE2 is involved in heart function and the development of hypertension. So is there any research involving ACE2 drugs in the queue? Yeah, so I think it's, you can answer this one of two ways. So if you're looking for drugs that, you know, directly, um, you know, direct ACE2 work, um, there actually is humanized um, ACE2. Uh, you can give that as, you can give that to a person. There's actually a small pilot study going on in China. They're looking at humanized um, ACE2 with the standard of care compared to standard of care. This is sort of a proof of concept study to see whether or not giving somebody uh, humanized ACE2 um, would have any potential benefit. Um, you got to remember that, you know, ACE2 um, could be downregulated um, by SARS-CoV-2 binding, but if you gave more of it, that could help um, mitigate some of the damage that's caused by angiotensin II uh, downstream. I think also indirectly, like I mentioned, well, SARTAN um, trial in, at the University of Minnesota, or the two trials, you know, that's sort of an indirect um, drug effect on ACE2 as well. So I think there's a lot of research going on. Um, I think another thing that's important to mention is there was, an, there was a preprint publication on MedRxiv. Um, it was, came out of China. It was over 500 patients with hypertension, and they, they clued in on about 50 patients who were elderly over the age of 65 with hypertension, and they looked at their, um, the severity of their COVID-19 um, infection progression and what um, antihypertensive they were on, and they, they saw a signal, a very small signal that ARBs may be protective and, and mitigate some of the progression of the disease. So I also think we may see um, research like that, sort of observational research, hypothesis generating research that will be needed to inform um, more trials like the question being asked here. Great, so my last question related to this topic is, do you have any final thoughts or conclusions that you wanna share with us um, from your webinar? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, if, if you wanted the quick take home points, there's, they're threefold. Patients who are taking ACEs or ARBs should continue taking them. Um, there's definitely a mortality benefit. They're on them for a reason. Uh, patients who require NSAID therapy um, should take NSAIDs even if they have COVID-19. And the decision of whether or not somebody should receive an NSAID uh, with a concomitant COVID-19 infection should be based on patient level factors, uh, not whether or not they have COVID-19. And I think the third point is there's going to be a lot of research coming out in this area. We need research in this area. So if it's something that you're passionate about and you're listening to this, I would encourage you to do that. You know, do some observational research, see what um, themes you can, you can draw out of the data and let's all try to work together to inform um, the research in this area and in future clinical trials in this area. Um, I would you know, continue to be skeptical of information that gets broadcast on social media and even in the mainstream media. Um, really, as clinicians, you need to dig into the substance, if any, that's behind these claims and, and, you know, use the training that you have to really evaluate whether or not these claims are true uh, or not, because they could, you know, these decisions could ultimately impact patient care. Um, thank you for sharing all those resources and for completely recapping your presentation. Um, for anyone who's interested, you can access Dr. Jailworth's webinar on the SIDP website. Um, but I just want to say thanks so much for taking the time to speak with Contagion today. We really appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Michaela.